New Grub Street by George Gissing. Dramatised by Tony Ramsey, with Harold Pinter as the narrator. Episode 3. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was looking for Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter is not here, nor will he be joining us. Please, forgive me this little bit of scheming. Edwin, I have something very important to speak to you about. If Amy has sent you to... She has not. I take it you have not heard from my daughter? Not for some time, as I believe you are well aware. Then you don't know what has come to pass? I have heard of nothing. I took Mr Carter into my confidence. He was good enough to suggest our meeting here, as it were, on neutral ground. It seems to me I must do everything I can in these sad circumstances. No, I am sorry, but I do not understand Amy's what... uncle, John Yule, is dead. And in his will, he bequeaths her £10,000. <sighs> I am glad to hear of her good fortune. You will feel, I'm sure, that this must put an end to your most unhappy differences. <laughs> How can it have that result? It puts you both in a very different position, does it not? Oh, let me beg you to go and see her. These differences between you might last a lifetime if no one can be persuaded to take the first step. Do be generous. Persuade her to let bygones be bygones. After what you have told me, it is impossible for me to go and see her unless she expressly invites me. Oh, please. This is absurd. What do you think people will say? If Amy is no longer poor, that is very far from a reason why I should go to her as a suppliant for forgiveness. You must understand, I am so very, very far from wishing to say anything disagreeable. But wasn't there some little ground for complaint on Amy's part? No, I think not. But I understand, you positively reproached her because she was reluctant to go and live in some very shocking place. Croydon? Please. I, I know you have Amy's best interests at heart, but I cannot review our troubles in this way. You refuse to take any step towards a restoration of good feeling? I am obliged to. And Amy would understand perfectly why I say so. And I can only say my daughter is very, very unfortunate. With the arrival of winter, Reardon's health suffered one of its periodic reversals. A chill seized him that kept him to his bed for several days. Each breath was a torture to him. A weight seemed to press down upon his chest. He had already suffered for a week, when, on an afternoon of snow and frost, he answered the door to Biffin and was met by the sight of his friend blackened with soot. His familiar shabby coat was singed and charred about the cuffs. Biffin, what on earth has happened? I'm afraid there has been a conflagration. My lodgings are burnt. The entire building. It almost took me as well. well let me sit down. Oh, my dear friend. <laughs> I escaped easily enough, but had to return for the manuscript, you see. I believe they thought I was mad. I've lost all my books, everything. But here is Mr. Bailey, safe and sound. If you might have been killed. Oh, you would have done the same, but I can take no more chances. The manuscript must be delivered to the publishers at once. I must send it, I think. I can't go looking like this. <laughs> Uh, have you note paper? Of course. On the table. Very well. Uh, should I say anything about the character of the book, do you think? Shall I hint that it deals with the ignobly decent? Better let them form their own judgment, I should think. Then I'll just say that I submit to them a novel of modern life, the scope of which is in some degree indicated by its title. You've really lost everything. I'm afraid so. What will you do? I must apply to my brother. He is prosperous. I believe he will help me. You won't always struggle like this, you know, Biffin. I have a superstitious faith in Mr. Bailey. If he leads you to triumph, you mustn't altogether forget me. Don't talk nonsense. It's not nonsense. Some day, when I'm established at Croydon, you shall go to a bookshop and ask if anyone's buying my novels. The attendant will say no, he has been quite forgotten. 
You can depend on it. I think not. <laughs> the one happy result of my experiences is that they have cured me of my ambition. All I want now is to live in peaceful obscurity. It won't be very peaceful at Croydon. It doesn't matter. I will be content. Besides, there is our expedition to Greece to look forward to. The year after next, if we're both alive, we go, you and I. The year after next? I have demonstrated that it is mathematically possible. You have, but so are a great many other things one does not dare to hope for. Telegram for Mr. Reardon. Thank you. It's nothing serious, I hope. William is ill of diphtheria. Amy is staying with Mrs. Carter at Brighton. She asks me to come. Oh, <coughs> this is bad. Look at the snow. We'll never find a cab. Uh, then we must walk to the station. <coughs> diphtheria is pretty sure to be fatal to a child of that age, isn't it? Oh, I'm afraid there's much danger. Why did she send for me, do you think? What an absurd question. And perhaps she thought it was her duty. This summons is proof that her thoughts turn to you as soon as she is in distress. Uh, here's a cab. You think so? Uh, oh! <gasps> Cabby! Uh, Reardon, you love your wife, and if I'm not mistaken, she loves you. Uh, go to her. Biffin. In with you. Go to her. Now. <laughs> He? The doctor's with him. I came as soon as I got your telegram. Amy, I... You're unwell. You're shaking. I have a chill. That's all. Then you should not have come in this weather. Amy, how could I not come? For you, I would go anywhere. To the pole, if you asked me. <sighs> oh, Edward. I'm sorry. My love. I'm so sorry. My love. What if William should die? What if we lose him, Edwin? Amy, listen to me. Whatever happens now, we mustn't be parted. Not anymore. Please, only say our misunderstandings are at an end. Edwin. Only say it. And I can bear anything. It's too soon to ask me this. Can you love me, Amy? As you once did. I don't know. But you don't deny the possibility. No. How can I? Come up now. See your son. <laughs> Is there any change, Doctor? This is William's father. May I? Uh, of course. Is he sleeping? He's been like this since yesterday. Asleep or awake, it's impossible to say. Poor child can hardly draw breath. There is no justice in this. How can such suffering be visited on a creature who has neither thought or done an ill deed? We have little enough reason to believe in natural justice, you and I. Stay with him. I won't be a moment. Doctor, if I might have a word. Certainly. Is there any hope for the little fellow? He is very ill and very weak, but it would be wrong to give up hope. A favourable turn might yet be expected. Thank you. Now, I wish to trouble you for a moment on my own account. I would be grateful if you would examine me. I shouldn't be surprised if you tell me I have congestion of the lungs. Very well, if you would undo your jacket. Oh. Have you had lung trouble before? A slight congestion of the right lung, not many weeks ago. And breathe in. And out. Oh. You should go to bed immediately. 
You shouldn't have allowed your symptoms to go this far. There is inflammation here. I've just come down from London. To bed, sir, at once. I cannot stay here. I must find a hotel. I know of one close by. Let me take you. I have a carriage outside. I am grateful, Doctor. Please, don't tell my wife that this is serious. She has enough to worry about with William. Very well. But you must rest. Don't speak a word more than you can help. He seems a little calmer. That's good. The doctor says we mustn't give up hope. Isn't that right, Doctor? Edwin, why not ask the doctor to examine you? I already have. A feverish cold, that's all. He's been good enough to offer me a lift to a hotel. He advises a good night's rest. I shall call again in the morning. Go back to William. I must sleep. We'll meet again tomorrow. Edwin. Thank you. For coming. Thank you. Alone in his hotel room, Reardon allowed himself repose for the first time since he quit London. The pain in his right side seemed to have grown worse. He tried to draw a deep breath, but found he could not. He was troubled by a sound, soft and continuous. Now remote, now suddenly clear. It must be the sea, he realised with a moment of joy. Soon a fit of coughing exhausted him and he slept. And suddenly he was at Patras, stepping into an open boat, stepping out onto the glassy sea. Above him the sky was the deepest blue, thick set with stars, and all around lay the dark shapes of vessels moored in the harbour. Lulled by the sound of oars, he turned his face south and looked out towards Ithaca, and the Ionian Islands. Amy. I must rest. How's William? Better, dear. But much better. You should be with him. Hush. You mustn't speak. The doctor says so. He's told you. You should have let me know you were ill. You shouldn't have come <coughs> like this. Hush. <coughs> Amy. Will you let Biffin know my address? Of course. His lodging's burnt down. He almost lost his book. He's been a true friend to me. I'll tell him. I promised we would go to Greece together. Then you must take me with you. Amy, nothing could make me happier than to have you always by my side. Nothing on this earth. Then be happy. Do you mean that? <laughs> yes. And William? You must rest. Tell me the truth. Shh. The truth, Amy. William died last night. There is only us now. a few days ago. You've been very ill. The doctor says I must not tire you. Then you've heard. They told me. I'm not two years old, Biffin. A child. I'm sorry. So very sorry. But she's mine again, Biffin. Amy is mine. I am very glad to hear it. And what of the book? What have they said of Mr. Bailey? Nothing so far. They will. They will, I promise you. Perhaps. Do you know, ever since I entered this room, I've been dreaming of Greece. Of Patras. I have watched so many sunsets over Ithaca. 
Isn't that strange? Not in the least. Who knows? Perhaps there are people throughout the Peloponnese, wrapped in their beds, dreaming of Bournemouth and Brighton. <laughs> then we must ask them when we get there, you and I. Which is the very first thing we shall do when we step off the boat. I'm glad you're here. If I'd known how ill you were on the night I pushed you into the carriage... You shouldn't have stopped me, you know that. No, I don't suppose I could. We don't belong anymore, do we, Biffin? There's no corner of the literary world where we might make our home. That's not true. Isn't it? What if it's all been a great mistake? What if I'm not a writer after all? There's been no mistake. Let a man write one real poem in a lifetime scribbling and it is sufficient to call him a poet. I have not written a single poem. You have written on neutral ground. Is it enough, do you think? It is more than enough. And you have written Mr. Bailey. And we may have been very little in society, but we have shared a friendship with Homer and Shakespeare and Dante. Then what cause for complaint can we possibly have? None. None whatever. I shall never go to Greece with you, Biffin. You're tired. You must rest now. I'll come again in the morning. You should sleep. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. It's true, isn't it? How many times have we said the words? And our little life is rounded. Shh. No more. You must rest, my friend. Rest. In episode three of New Grub Street by George Gissing, the narrator was Harold Pinter. Edwin Reardon was played by Jonathan Firth. Amy Reardon by Amelia Fox. Jasper Milvane by Jonathan Cake. Mr. Yule by Kenneth Cranham. And Marion Yule by Tracy Ann Oberman. Anne Beach was Mrs. Yule. Helen Longworth, Dora. Ian Masters, Biffin. David Timpson, Quamby. Gemma Churchill, Amy's mother, and Martin Hyder, the doctor. New Grub Street was dramatised by Tony Ramsey, with music by Mia Soteriou, and directed by Janet Whittaker. <laughs>